Hello, and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. We just had a great chat with Professor John Tifo from the University of Kansas Medical Center. He's an expert on the liver in regards to its metabolism and the effect of diet and exercise. If your caloric intake is greater than your caloric expenditure, you tend to end up with elevated glucose and fat in the blood. This can then cause dysfunction in the liver and result in fatty liver. This then plays a role in insulin resistance. And importantly, exercise both prevents and treats fatty liver and improves liver function. I think you'll really enjoy this one, so stick around. Hi, John. Welcome to Inside Exercise. How are you? Hi, Glenn. Doing well. Thanks for having me. What were you into? Were you a sports person? Like, how did you end up being an exercise, sort of a liver and exercise guy? Yeah, so I uh, grew up playing all the sports. I really loved basketball and football, and then I ended up playing football in college. And uh, I actually was a biology major, but our university made us take a personal wellness class. Every, every freshman had to take a personal wellness class. And I had to go over to the sports, I guess it was called health and human performance um, department to take that class. And I just didn't even know there was such a department. I didn't know there was exercise science, exercise physiology. Um, and at the same time, I was getting really interested in uh, strength and conditioning and how, you know, exercise training could make you bigger, faster, stronger. And mm -hmm. so those things kind of coalesced and I changed majors to, um, to exercise science. And at, th at that point, I wanted to be a strength coach for quite a long time. Okay. Yep. Wow. And so that's, that's pretty good that the college makes people do a, a health, what was it? Health and exercise. It was what called was it called? personal wellness. Yeah. Okay. It was, it included everything from STDs. Like I mean, I'll never forget the videos <laughs> they showed us <laughs> okay. on what can, ha what can happen uh, to like, you know, taking care of, uh, yeah, being active and nutrition and all those kinds of things. It was pretty good. So now they probably ban all those books and videos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> things are kind of weird. All right. Mm -hmm. So tell me, um, so then how did you get into the liver? Well, how did you end up looking at metabolism, exercise and the liver, et cetera? Yeah. So um, the strength and conditioning thing didn't work out because I played a fifth year of college football in the States. They redshirt you. And so then you get an extra year. That means a year where you don't play and then you get a ex extra year of eligibility. And so I graduated before that last year. So I just started working on a master's degree in exercise science and it turns out that um, to go become a strength coach, they want you to be a graduate assistant and to be working on your master's. But I was already done with my master's. So uh -huh. no one really wanted me. And uh, one of my uh, mentors, um, faculty members said, you know, you should go get a PhD. And he connected me with uh, Dr. Jeff Pottinger, who was at KU in Lawrence. And I was able to get in kind of last minute in May for the August start. And that's how I got, I got there. And uh Dr. Pottinger was was okay with me being interested in sports performance, but he made it very clear, you know, do you want to work on something that affects 1% of the 1% or do you want to work on things that affect the health of, you know, millions of mm -hmm. Americans? And that was pretty persuasive. And at the time they were doing a lot of obesity metabolism research. And um, my father died at a young age of uh, cardiovascular disease and he had type 2 diabetes and a lot of people in my family have struggled with obesity and metabolic diseases. So I think all those things kind of came together and kind of just shifted my interest from how does exercise make you a better athlete to how does it improve your metabolic health? Um, right. And then after my PhD, um, my PhD was mostly like systems physiology, not very um, invasive or, or biochemical or molecular. And so I wanted to go to a place where I could learn more about those techniques. And I went and did a postdoc at uh, East Carolina University with Linus Dome. And that was a really great place to merge my background in systems physiology with more basic um, biochemistry and uh, molecular metabolism. Um, and that, when I was there, the focus was completely on skeletal muscle metabolism um, and how that um, is affected by obesity. And I kind of could see the writing on the wall that that was a pretty um, competitive area. And so when I started as faculty at the University of Missouri, I was kind of like openly looking for spaces where, you know, that weren't, weren't as competitive, but that we knew were important. And I had started seeing mm -hmm. that there was more and more on fatty liver and that exercise seemed to be something that uh, affected it. Um, 
so I started collecting liver tissues from different animal models that we were uh, collaborating with it with people at Missouri. And then there was a faculty member, um, Dr. Jamal Ibda, who was the director of gastroenterology. And through weird occurrences, I met him, um, and he was in, he studied fat oxidation in the liver. And so he he uh, brought me into his division um, as one of my co appointments, and he really mentored me and and convinced me that this should be the area I should go into how exercise influences liver metabolism and influences risk for fatty liver. So that's kind of how it all came together. Yeah, I've seen him on a bunch of your papers. So uh, I had, to be honest, I hadn't picked up on that name previously, but when I was looking through all your papers, can I, can I ask you, you said your father had type 2 diabetes. Were you aware, because obviously you're into exercise and metabolism and, you know, insulin resistance. Were you aware at that time, you know, that there's like a genetic link there, you know, was that part of the reason you were going into that or was it just a... Um, I don't know if I knew about the genetic links there. I mean, he he died when I was three and he had heart disease late in his, I think probably mid thirties, he started having heart disease. And back then they, they didn't exercise him. You know, they didn't really change their diet. Mm -hmm. They just said to go on disability. So all the things that we know now, and, and if wow. statins would have been around, might have helped him too, right? And mm. uh, and then I think he developed diabetes towards the last year or two, and it was undiagnosed for a long time, and they didn't figure it out till his eyesight went really uh, poorly. But I'm sure that that um, led to his, you know, death of cardiovascular disease. But um, I think I was influenced by, you know, at back then, a lot of exercise was solely focused on how does it affect cardiovascular disease outcomes, right? And so yeah, I think true. that was part of part of what led me into it. Ah, that's true. Okay, so we're talking about the liver, and um, you know, obviously, there's been a bit of a bit of a focus on muscle. I've been more, I was more of a muscle guy, and there's a whole bunch of muscle. And when you think about exercise, you know, it's easy to think exercise is good for muscle or makes the muscle mm -hmm. insulin sensitive, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, why don't you tell us why should we be interested in the liver and why is the liver important in that regard? Yeah. So, I mean, as you know, we talked about this earlier, uh, I watched Dr. Wasserman's um, mm -hmm. session on your podcast and he did a great job of explaining this and I can no way ever explain it as nicely as he does. But basically, as soon as you start moving um, and your glucose consumption rate goes up in muscle and other tissues as a result of that, you have to produce glucose in your body to maintain euglycemia or you go hypoglycemic. And the liver is what is the organ that does that. So as soon as work um, goes up and ATP demand goes up in other tissues and glucose starts being consumed, the liver, um, and a lot of Dave's work has figured out how this works, the liver responds very quickly to start pumping out glucose. Mm -hmm. And so that is the primary reason why the liver is so important for exercise and at the same time, that's the primary metabolic demand that exercise puts on the liver is that's a very energy costly process to, to, uh, to produce, you know, make glucose and, and maintain it over time. Yeah. So, so that's um, during exercise. And then what about uh, more sort of long term? So, you know, maintaining your uh, health. So what about like, how can it go wrong in terms of insulin sensitivity, for example? So, yeah, so um, the muscle, as you know, is important for glucose disposal um, after meals. Um, but the liver actually is actually, uh, you know, it's um, uh, Al Charrington at, at Vanderbilt, who was who worked with Wasserman, did a lot of work on this. The liver is also a primary consumption site for glucose after a meal. Um, and the liver uses that glucose to replenish glycogen levels. Um, and then in terms of, so one of the ways that, one of the things that happens is the liver gets um, uh, has reduced ability to take up the glucose um, after a meal. The other primary thing that happens is when you have exogenous nutrients coming in from a meal, you don't want the liver to make glucose anymore. You want to shut off hepatic glucose production. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in insulin resistant conditions, the liver doesn't shut off glucose production appropriately. So then you still are producing hepatic glucose um, at a high level and you have glucose coming in through external from your exogenous sources. And so your glycemia to a meal goes way up in, in, in response to what it should. And that's because insulin is not turning off glucose production like it should. It's insulin resistance, just like you have insulin resistance in muscle and adipose. Perfect. Um, the other, the other components are that, you know, uh, 
the, the lipids that we treat with statins, those come from the liver. So if you have high cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol, if you have high triglycerides, those come from the liver. So um, poor metabolic function of the liver can also lead to higher cholesterol and higher triglycerides, which are cardiovascular risk factors. Okay, so if we kind of summarize that a bit, we're saying that the liver is important during exercise because it releases glucose and your muscle uses the glucose for energy. But mm. also after a meal, we know the muscle is the major site of glucose disposal. So the glucose goes in the blood, insulin is released from the pancreas that stimulates the muscle to take up the glucose. But then also it needs to switch off. Not everyone with obesity, but a lot of people with obesity and people with type 2 diabetes, the liver doesn't shut off. So that's part of the reason why the glucose stays elevated. Yeah. Yep. And that's also why they have high fasting glucose. So they, they just have higher glucose production at all times, not only after a meal, but at all times they have higher fasting glucose production. And that's why fasting glucose goes up over time. Yep. Yep. Okay. So with um, insulin resistance, um, the liver starts to you know have problems. So it becomes fatty. What is fatty liver and why is that important? So fatty liver is when you um, store an excessive amount of lipids in the liver. Um, the clinical definition is when greater than 5% of the mass of the liver is comprised of fat or lipids. Yeah. Um, and it's really, um, it's directly associated with obesity. So if you plot a large you know, data set and you correlate BMI to, to fatty liver prevalence, you will get a nice straight line but if you dig into that data a little deeper, and I haven't published this work, others in the field have, you actually have a lot of heterogeneity. So there can be people that are morbidly obese and don't have fatty liver, and there can be people that are on the lower uh, range of overweight and very fatty liver. So there's other factors at play. Um, pathologically, um, it's, it's, it's multiple levels. Uh, we think that insulin resistance plays a big role, and that is because if you're insulin resistant, Every time you consume a meal, glucose is not going into the tissues as readily as it should. And so that becomes a substrate for the liver to turn into lipids through de novo, li de novo lipogenesis. You also then have chronically higher insulin levels or at least higher insulin levels after every meal to try to, to compensate for that insulin resistance. And insulin is a potent regulator of uh, de novo lipogenesis and triglyceride synthesis in the liver. And then third, you just have basically hyperchloric conditions where you have way too much substrate coming in, both lipids and glucose, and the liver has to handle those and deal with those. And one of the ways it does that is to just traffic it away and, or pack it um, into storage. And so we were designed to store a certain amount of fat in our livers. In fact, if you um, fast a mouse overnight, they will get steatosis, they'll get fatty liver, but it'll of course go away um, when they mm. go back to eating normally. We probably are the same way. We probably are meant to have, be able to take, um, increase our lipid storage in the liver and have it go up and down over time. Um, but we just, um, with fatty liver, you just have this chronic hypercaloric type conditions combined with the insulin resistance um, and the oversupply of lipids to the liver that leads to a chronic elevation, like a new homeostasis for fat storage in the liver. Okay, wow, that's really interesting. So you're saying with the, the rodent study, so you fast them overnight, they start to have more blood fats in the, they have more fats in the blood and then they just take it up. I remember we did a prac in biochemistry or, or yeah, biochemistry where we, it was a really good prac actually. We had, um, we do put rats on a high fat um, diet or a low fat diet. It was a bit sad. You have we killed the rats and then we looked at the liver. Totally mm -hmm. just, everything was just switched over like crazy. Yeah. yeah? So the yeah. liver is very adaptable. It sounds like it. I think it's very adaptable. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if All you right. were to give those rats, you know, just enough activity, they could probably have a new homeostasis for for higher liver fat in their liver, but not have any metabolic abnormalities and be just mm -hmm. fine. Um, that's there's really never been a study in the literature that's looked at that. Um, you're familiar with the athlete's paradox, where mm. in the late '90s we thought that triglycerides and muscle were causing insulin resistance, and then we found out that endurance athletes are very insulin sensitive and have high triglycerides. There could be something like that occurring in the liver to a certain degree, but we would need we would need to be able to measure those liver lipids, you know, pretty multiple times throughout the day to try to really dis dissect that out. Okay, um, but I think that that could be a possibility. But in the case of 
a sedentary individual who's chronically on a hypercaloric diet, it just increases over time. And then there's a new homeostasis that's associated with metabolic abnormalities. Okay. Wow. That's really interesting. So I might just try and tie that together for some people that haven't, haven't aren't aware of that. So yeah, the paradox in, in muscles. Is, so we had Brett Goodpaster on uh, early on, but he was more talking about aging, but he's done a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about there, I guess, is the, the turning over. So if you've got a, if you've got an obese person or an insulin resistant person, for example, they might have a lot of fat in their muscle because it's like, you got to put it somewhere. Right. And but it's not turning over. And then the athletes have a lot of fat in their muscle because they're really good at burning fat. And that's like a, 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 a uh, you know, a positive adaptation and they're turning it over. So it's probably, the, you're saying it's similar in the liver. Maybe if you're turning it, I know you said it hasn't necessarily been looked at, but if you're turning it over, that's probably fine. But if it's just chronically there, that's the problem. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. And the, the other thing you mentioned, just maybe just explain was the de novo lipogenesis. Maybe just tell people what that is. Yeah, so that's a biochemical term for converting carbohydrates into lipids, and that primarily occurs in the liver. Um, and so when you drink uh, soda or, you know, lots of sugary beverages or anything with high sugar, especially with fructose, that energy goes to the liver and it gets readily converted into lipids, especially when you're in a condition of postprandial, which means post-meal condition where insulin mm -hmm. levels are high. And so yeah. then that that can dramatic and there's evidence that upwards of 40 percent or maybe even more of the lipids that are in the liver come from de novo lipogenesis and that's data from human subjects wow okay so if people want to know more about because you said especially fructose they should look at uh, javier gonzalez podcast the last one we talked a lot about what happens in the liver if you have glucose versus fructose versus mm -hmm. sucrose not, which is yep Exactly. So maybe we'll get back to that with the old high fructose corn syrup and things later on. So if we talk about, um, oh yeah, so I was just thinking, so it was interesting you said some people, you know, as you said, on average, if you look at the BMI goes up, fatty liver goes up, you said some people don't have that. That that was interesting and kind of surprising because I was assuming there's a term called ectopic, as you know, which is ectopic fat is where you've sort of stuck fat where you wouldn't expect it to be. I was assuming that if you have so much fat floating around, whether it's, you know, direct from fat intake or if it's the de novo lipogenesis converting or this excess carbohydrate to fat, I was assuming it would sort of just go everywhere, you know, so it'd end up on your coronary arteries, it would end up in your liver, it'd end up in your body fat, obviously, and then your muscle. Is that not necessarily the case? And I wonder if they know why. We don't know why there's heterogeneity for that, for in mm. terms of that if you have excess BMI, it doesn't mean that a one-to-one, -one, you're going to have excess fat in your liver. We don't know. I, I personally think my hypothesis is that those people probably um, have higher physical activity, uh, higher aerobic capacity. Um, maybe they have different eating patterns. Uh, maybe, maybe they eat one large meal and then have enough period of time throughout the day where they're not you know, constantly having calories coming in and they're hyperinsulinic. Um, but I, I tend to think it's probably they're a little bit more fit and a little bit more physically active. Great. All right. So I think we're both itching to talk about the exercise part more. <laughs> sure. So um, what's actually going on there? So what do you think's happening to make the liver uh, less fatty or turn over the fat more or whatever? Yeah. So we don't know, you know, first of all, we don't know the exact mechanism and, but I want to highlight, I don't ever think there's going to be an exact mechanism. I think exercise works through like the the layers of an onion. I mm -hmm. think there's systemic metabolic adaptations that occur that protect the liver or can treat the liver from, from fatty liver with exercise. And I think there's intrinsic changes within the liver itself um, as well. So I want to start out by highlighting that um, initially when the field, uh, realized that lifestyle therapies were effective for, for fatty liver. And really, it's still the only known effective therapy. Um, it, was, it was dogma that you had to lose weight. They knew exercise was important, but they thought exercise had to be paired with weight loss. But that is not true. There is tons of data now showing that anyone that's obese can lose fat in their liver or reduce fatty liver with exercise alone without changing their total adiposity or their total body mass, which I think is really profound mm -hmm. and fits in well with that heterogeneity I was talking about between BMI and fatty liver. Um, 
The other thing I want to point out, um, but we don't know the mechanisms. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that's really of interest is I have some collaborators in the field that have studied um, how um, how the liver adapts to the the hyperchloric conditions that cause fatty liver. So these are studies that have been done in mouse models where they feed them a high fat, high sucrose diet and they track how the liver responds metabolically over time. Um, and this is also studies where they've looked at human subjects that have that are obese with fatty liver versus not uh, obese without fatty liver versus healthy controls. Um, and what they have found is that the liver actually metabolically adapts and tries to compensate um, for the excess um, energy by increasing fat oxidation, by increasing TCA cycle flux, and by increasing gluconeogenesis. So that is why fatty liver leads to hyperglycemia is the liver's got all this energy coming in and the only way it can deal with that excess energy is to try to store it or metabolize it. And by metabolizing it, the TCA cycle flux goes up. You have a lot of anaporosis and cataporosis, which I know is a fancy biochemical term, but you have a lot of uh, substrates going in, biochemical substrates coming into the TCA cycle, a lot of them coming out. But at the end of the day, what that means is you have a lot of biosynthesis occurring as a result of that, which means making carbohydrates into fat or making glucose, and then the glucose gets pumped out and leads to metabolic derangements. Right. So, okay. So the liver's trying to deal with all this excess fat and excess carbohydrate. Yep. By, so when you say fatty acid oxidation, so that's burning it off. That's yeah, burning so, it off. Yep. A, a, or storing it or shipping it out. Yeah. So or it has to do it something. Yeah, it has to do something. And initially, as it looks like the literature would suggest that as fatty liver is developing, there is enhanced mitochondrial function, in, enhanced fat oxidation, just basically enhanced meta metabolic flux of every of all these pathways to try to compensate with the situation. And then as you transition into a more pathological state, which we call NASH, which is non-alcoholic state hepatitis, that means you've transitioned from just excess fat storage to now you have inflammation and actually liver injury. And once you get to that point, the data suggests that then there's a loss, that there starts to be a decline in mitochondrial function. Um, and uh, the compensation kind of goes away, and that's when you get more inflammation and oxidative stress. What's fascinating about this is, at the end of the day, if you think about this condition, it's a condition where the liver is being oversupplied with free fatty acids, oversupplied with glucose, and it's trying to metabolically deal with the situation. Now, if you compare that to exercise, what happens when you exercise, especially if you haven't eaten in a while, is that you have a, a, a huge increase in lipolysis. So that's breaking fatty acids down from your adipose depots. Those get dumped into the bloodstream and the liver gets oversupplied with fatty acids, just like it does in this hypercaloric type condition. But the, the difference is that you are, you're increasing the metabolic rate in your body your glucose uptake is higher in the peripheral tissues like your muscle. Your liver is producing glucose in a way that's being pulled on, if that makes sense. So the energy utilization rates and the peripheral tissues are pulling on the liver and asking, mm -hmm. exactly, and asking the liver to make more glucose to maintain homeostasis. So the liver's oxidizing more fat to provide the ATP that's needed to make the glucose. Um, and so you have these this dichotomy or this, this paradigm where obesity diet induced fatty liver seems to cause very similar mechanisms as exercise induced positive adaptations in the liver. And so the next stage in the next five or 10 years, we really want to really figure out why is that? Why does, why do you get these similar metabolic adaptations to a negative and a positive thing, but then you have completely different outcomes in terms of your health. Um, wow. And I think ultimately if you think about it, if you exercise every day and the liver is getting used to turning on metabolic flux, used to oxidizing fatty acids at a high level, then when you go to grandma's for Christmas and you overconsume for two or three straight days, the engine's burning at a, at a higher level, the engine's burning hot. And so it can handle that substrate overflow because it's attuned to that. It's used to doing that every time you exercise, if that makes sense. 
Wow, there's a lot of great stuff there. I'm just trying to think think through. So, so during the one thing I wanted to clarify. So during the actual exercise, yeah, you're saying the liver's releasing glucose to maintain because the muscle's taking up to so try and maintain glucose levels, and then the fatty acids from the you know the stored fat and you know the subcutaneous you know what stuff we think about um, mm -hmm. on the love handles they're releasing fat for the muscle to take up as well but you said that increase in fatty acids in the blood is actually dot 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 can you just explain that again and is the liver actually releasing fat itself is it actually releasing fat for the muscle i don't think Why don't you... no so the liver is not releasing fat during exercise but Think of the liver as an energy converter. So as Dr. Wasserman, you know, showed on your, or talked about on your previous podcast, there's a very finite amount of glucose in the body. Mm -hmm. And there's only about four grams of glucose in circulation. And there's only like two or 300 grams of glucose in glycogen in your liver. So if you, if you don't start making glucose in the liver within 30 to 45 minutes of the onset of exercise, you're going to go hypoglycemic. So how does the liver do that? Well, gluconeogenesis, which is making glucose in the liver, requires a ton of ATP. So what your liver does is it takes the super abundant amount of energy that we have in fatty acids in all of our adipose tissues. The, those get lipolyzed, released into circulation, and the liver takes the energy from that, the, those fatty acids and it uses that to make ATP, which fuels gluconeogenesis and making of glucose. And of course, the components of the fatty acids or the triglycerides being broken down also are substrates for making glucose. Glycerol is important uh, for making glucose. Um, but that's basically how you want to think about the liver as yes. an energy converter that takes a substrate that's usually in abundance to make another substrate that's very low in abundance, which is, of course, critical for neurological, you know, mm. for your brain. You got to have glucose for your brain. Yeah. All right, so so we've talked about the liver breaking down its glycogen to glucose, but also, as you said, gluconeogenesis, which is genesis yep. of new glucose from um, other substrates. Yeah, you're saying that the liver it takes a lot of energy to um, produce the new glucose, the gluconeogenesis. Where does it get that energy from? Yeah, so it gets the um, energy from metabolizing fat, from oxidation of fat. And in fact, it's well known in the biochemical literature that if you, or biochemistry literature, that if you inhibit fat oxidation in the liver, you cannot make glucose or you have diminished okay. production. Um, on the flip side, there's studies showing that, like I said before, if you feed a high fat diet, or even if you infuse fatty acids into the body of rodents, that their glucose production rates will go up. So there's an intimate connection between hepatic fat metabolism and, and, and hepatic glucose production. So that's really nice then. So during exercise, so no, so no wonder you kept bringing up exercise because it all fits together perfectly. You've got this fatty liver, you know, if you've, if you've actually got a fatty liver mm -hmm. and then during exercise, you've got the chance to, to oh. actually, you know, oxidize fat to get the energy for gluconeogenesis. So you're actually reducing your fatty liver. So right. That's awesome. All right. And can we get think about practical sort of things if people are wondering how much exercise do I need to do for how long, what intensity or whatever for the liver to actually uh, kick in? I guess it depends. We talked in other podcasts about at the start of exercise, you're mainly release, releasing liver, um, breaking down liver glycogen to glucose. And then the longer you go, the more your gluconeogenesis kicks in. So I wonder if you can flesh that out for me. So unfortunately, although there's been quite a few studies done looking at exercise and lowering liver fat, we don't know a precise duration. We don't know a pr precise intensity or modality. It seems to be so far that everything works. Um, if you look, uh, one of my colleagues, Scott Rector, put together several studies, and it does look kind of like um, maybe a little bit higher intensity exercise is more efficacious, but again, a trial has not been done to really examine that. Um, but what's interesting is even resistance training lowers liver fat, and there are published studies on that. And and, and it actually doesn't surprise me because there's been studies for quite a while now showing that resistance training really is powerful in lowering visceral adiposity too. Um, and you know, visceral adiposity and liver fat seem to be connected because when visceral adiposity gets broken down. The, fa the, the fat from the viscera goes into the portal vein and goes right to the liver. Um, 
there is epidemiology showing that even light intensity physical activity is associated with less liver fat. Um, and uh, there's also really nice literature showing that independent of looking at what kind of exercise people do, if they have higher aerobic capacity or a higher VO2 max, um, either high or moderate, their risk for fatty liver goes down independent of their obesity status. There's even a study from Finland um, called the, in the, I think it's called the Finnish Youth Study, and they publish a bunch of different papers on these kids. And they have a really nice paper showing that even in the obese kids, if they compare the high fit to the low fit, there's a dramatically dramatic difference in uh, prevalence of fatty liver. Actually, that made me think of, um, I was going to bring it up later with some of the other bits and pieces you've looked at, but the, I know you've looked at these high capacity uh, running rats mm -hmm. and the low capacity running rats. So just maybe just explain what they are and the fact that they don't actually even exercise. They're just, you know, naturally sure. good runners. And it looks sure. like they might be protected there. Yeah? Yeah, so that's kind of the reason we study those rats. So um, it's long been known that mortal early mortality is associated with low fitness, low aerobic capacity. You could also call it low endurance exercise capacity, and that people that have high fitness are have have less risk for early mortality. And over the last thirty years, that's been extended to various different disease states. Almost any disease you can look at has been shown that low fitness is drives up risk and high fitness protects. And the same thing occurs with fatty liver, as I mentioned before, that it, it depend, doesn't matter what your body weight status is to a certain degree, that if you're high fit, you have protection against fatty liver. And so that's the reason why we study these, what they're called high capacity runner, low capacity runner rats. Um, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Steve Britton and his colleague, Lauren Cook became very interested Dr. Lauren Cook became very interested in why aerobic capacity affects disease states um, and realized that there was no uh, animal model to study mechanisms because a single gene knockout or a single gene overexpression isn't going to replicate the polygenic phenotype that's, that occurs with high and low aerobic capacity where you, know, you have multiple different tissues contributing and multiple different pathways playing a role. So they designed rats that were basically bred for high or low running capacity. They took a mixed strain of rats, ran them to exhaustion on a treadmill, and simply took the top 10% of the performers and bred them together, and the bottom 10% of the performers and bred them together. And then they kept breeding for that divergence. Um, I think they're now generation 42. They started in 1999. Uh, and they published a paper in 2005 showing that the high capacity running rats could run, a, I think, around one kilometer, um, and the low capacity running rats could only run about two or 300 meters. And, um, and that, that means that they were bred for high and low aerobic capacity. Yeah, so I want to highlight that they don't ever get exposure to exercise. They're just sedentary mm -hmm. in their cages, but it's like breeding for these, for these traits. And so what those rats allow us to do is really examine how intrinsic aerobic capacity or intrinsic endurance um, exercise capacity influences metabolic health. So yes, we've done a whole bunch of studies in those two strains of rats. When we feed them a high fat, high sucrose diet that should induce steatosis, the high capacity runner rats are always protected and the low capacity runner rats are very susceptible. And we've spent about 10 years trying to phenotype why they're protected and susceptible. And a lot of the data that's come out of those rats has then led to us doing exercise studies to follow up and see if exercise promotes the same kind of adaptations. Um, and we're still learning uh, about that. And again, that also is data from those rats has really highlighted how it's probably not one tissue or one pathway in a tissue that provides the protection. That it's probably multiple layers whole body insulin sensitivity, whole body fat oxidation, intrinsic of things that occur in the liver themselves are really critical. And now we've come upon some novel uh, pathways uh, related to bile acid metabolism that we're trying to follow up that we think might play a role. Yeah, bio acid. I saw that. I was going to bring it up. We had time later on. But um, what I wanted to touch on was something I thought earlier, and you just said it again, was the fact it's not just one organ, one tissue, whatever. And that's the thing that's become really clear and it, and it made me think earlier when you were talking about 
um, how the liver compensates to the, the high fat, the high glucose to a point, and then it then it then it can't anymore and it goes downhill. And it reminded me of the pancreas, you know, that as you yep. become insulin resistant, you release more insulin, more insulin, but you get to a certain point, and again, it might be fatty acids that actually is involved in this, mm-hmm. then that, that it then drops off and it can't produce um as much insulin. So probably not surprising. You know, we you used to think about it more, you know, I'm a muscle guy and you're a liver guy, but I think we're all sort of coming to the point that we're an integrated organism and yep. it would make it would make no sense almost that one tissue would be perfect and the rest are screwed up or whatever it kind of makes sense that they all sort of do what they can and then they all maybe you know yeah maybe, and, and a loss of a uh, change in one can lead to an adaptation in the other and maybe mm-hmm. that other tissue's adaptation is enough to maintain homeostasis for a while but then it collapses and then it causes a further decrease in a different tissue so yeah it's all integrative and it's mm-hmm. You know, for the next round of scientists coming up, it's really good to try to learn a little bit about these different tissues and how they interact so that you can have more impactful findings. Exactly. So, All right. Yeah. So I guess part of me wants to talk more about exercise. Part of me thinks about diet. And I guess if we're talking about fatty liver, do you think you need to actually almost start at the diet? You know, because I know exercise is probably good for the liver for people that aren't overweight and don't have a fatty liver. But I guess what's tending to go wrong in Western society, especially, is that the diet is leading to all these excess fatty acids and increase. Um, it's funny, it's, it's even coming from my mouth because I'm usually always exercise first, but I'm trying to think, well, I guess they go together, right? That Anyway, why don't you flesh that out for me? Well, I think at the end of the day, you could get in the weeds about you know, changing saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids and changing how much carbohydrates you consume and if they're simple carbohydrates versus complex carbohydrates and all that. Um, and I think there's probably some things there that we could garner, especially because of the rule of de novo lipogenesis. But ultimately, if you're in a positive energy balance day after day and you're continually gaining weight year after year, that's going to put the liver in a really metabolically challenging situation. So I think if we could get people from maintain from stopping from gaining weight and maintain their current body weight, which would mean that they get down to a eucaloric diet where they they're eating their energy requirements that their body needs. That would be step one in terms of diet. I tend to think, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist. I work with a lot of nutrition people. I've been on a lot of nutrition papers. I, it's really important, no doubt about it. But a lot of this is, is really energy balance. Um, yes. At the end of the day. Yes. Um, energy balance across the population. But you were saying even within one individual, though, in theory, you could have um, a little bit overweight, but your exercise can nullify that. Yes. But, um, yeah. So, you know, when we're talking about energy balance, we're talking about calories in, calories out. Some people are sort of like, oh, it's no longer that. And, you know, things get complicated. But I think it's fair to say, essentially, if you're, you know, taking in about the same as you're expending. So I guess the question then is, what about if you're taking in a lot and exercising a lot, you know, so that, and, and then what about if this thing about, can you outrun a bad diet? I, I, I don't know if you necessarily know that, but you yeah. know, if these people are at grandma's all the time, maybe <laughs> I'm not giving grandma a hard time, but if you're eating crappy food and you're expending enough to keep that balance, what do you, is your liver? Okay. Do you, I yeah. It's, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, um, can you outrun a bad diet? I hate that comment um, because, first Sorry. of all, what's a bad diet? I mean, yeah. I'm just putting it out there, but what's yeah. a bad diet? And what do you mean by outrun? Okay. Um, but in rodents, for sure, you can outrun a bad diet. If we give running wheels to animals that are hyperphagic and or hyperphagic and eat high fat, high sucrose diet. Hyperphagic, sorry, what's... Um... Oh, hyperphagic means that uh, they're genetically programmed to overeat. So... We've done a bunch of works on these animals called OLEF rats that they basically don't know when they're full, so they eat constantly. And if you put them in a cage, in a sedentary cage where they have no access to exercise, they will develop fatty liver, obesity, insulin resistance, and then they'll eventually get type 2 diabetes and you know they it, it goes really south. If we give them running wheels, they eat away more of the diet or they eat even more and they're completely protected against everything. And it's not like they're running, you know, 20 kilometers a day. They run just a moderate amount. And as they get older, they run less Mm -hmm. Um, and they get to where they only run two or three kilometers a night, but they're still metabolically protected. So 
I think there is some evidence that exercise can be protective against um, a diet, um, against the poor diet. Now, at the same time, there's no doubt that if I go out and exercise for an hour, I may only burn four or 500 calories and I can blow that away with one bowl of ice cream, right? I can eat one bowl of ice cream and I've brought in another 700 calories and just completely gotten rid of the effect in terms of energy balance on, on weight. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I've packed on some pounds, even though I'm very active and we all kind of, a lot of us do. So I'm not saying that it can completely protect against overweightness or you know gradually gaining adiposity as you get older but i think it can protect against the metabolic dysfunction that's commonly associated with the excess weight right okay now with the exercise i'm wondering what the signals are sorry my dog's i'm actually gonna pick my dog up there he is <laughs> hey buddy um, he's, he's not a bad lad he's quite quiet actually um with the exercise, I'm wondering what is the signal? Because, you know, we know it's easy to think again when you're, this is the acute, so during the actual exercise, it's easy to think again with muscle, you know, glucose uptake, you know, it's contracting, stuff's going on. It's a bit harder to think, what's, how's the liver actually know you exercise, uh, you're exercising, do you know? Yeah, I think it's the same signals. I think it could be things that we don't know yet for sure, but I think it's the same signals that um, cause gluconeogenesis to get elevated in the liver. And so Dave has really, uh, Dave Wasserman's really shown nicely that that is a combination of elevations in glucagon, reductions in insulin. The fatty acids going up in circulation is probably another signal from lipolysis. Uh, uh, Mark Fabreo and Binta have shown that IL-6 that's released during exercise for muscle also promotes fat oxidation in the liver. Um, it's And it's specific to exercise-induced increases in IL-6, not, uh, you know, IL-6 associated mm -hmm. with inflammation. Um, I think other signals could be lactate could play a role. Um, there's evidence that lactate can at least increase mitochondrial biogenesis. So, and there's probably some evidence of maybe catecholamines play a role, but Dr. Wasserman's data really shows it's really the glucagon and insulin mm -hmm. ratio changing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's other things that we'll learn in the future about the signal. Um, okay. And then and then the exercise also has a more chronic effect. So it makes the liver more insulin sensitive. I guess that's something we haven't really talked about. Um, so do we know what's going on there? Yeah, it's actually even one bout of exercise improves insulin sensitivity in the liver. And it seems to be pretty similar to muscle that there's just a, a, a sensitization of the insulin signaling pathway such that a certain amount of insulin promotes a more powerful signal. And the mechanisms are not completely understood there as well. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so we've been talking about exercise. And I guess we've also got physical activity, which is kind of less structured. You know, it's a bit overlaps, obviously, a lot. But then you've also got inactivity. How, how do all these things sort of fit together with the liver? So, yeah, so there is some evidence that physical inactivity may increase risk for fatty liver. And certainly in our animal models, if they're inactive, they're more susceptible. Um, and there is uh, human data showing that comparing inactive versus active, you do have differences in susceptibility for fatty liver when you control for all other variables, including uh, obesity status. Um, and we've actually done some studies um, in rats. Uh, this was in collaboration with uh, Frank Booth and Scott Rector, where we would give uh, these rats that overeat these running wheels, as I discussed earlier, and then we would lock the wheels and take the running wheel away. And within two to four weeks, they, they started to have metabolic derangements in the liver and fatty liver started to come back. So... Um, Okay. It was suggestive that, you know, the exercise effects that are in the liver are not there permanently to stay, that they're really required by every bout every day. And if you take it away, then you start to get negative effects um, occurring, much like with muscle and some resistance. So much, yeah. So use it or lose it. But, and you tend yep. to think of the muscle, you know, like the, the liver as well. And again, it's, it's integrative. It makes sense. If we think about, um, you know, people being more susceptible to, to fatty liver and more susceptible to, you know, even even exercise, some people respond more or less. Have, have people looked with the liver at, you know, genetics and even epigenetics with in regards to the liver and, and exercise and diet, et cetera? So I, I'm not aware of a lot of, of data that's out there. I'll give some caveats here. Um, for example, 
we know that the high capacity running rats, that when we feed them a hypercaloric diet in an acute period of time, and we look at what genes change in their expression profile compared to the low capacity running rats, we get a much greater change in the number of genes that respond both up and down in the HCR versus the LCR. So there's like a responsiveness of being able to metabolically change much, much greater. Um, another thing that we haven't talked about today is that female rodents and our, our women are both um, somewhat protected or, or largely protected against fatty liver. Uh, when they have normal ovarian function and estrogen levels, but when they go through menopause or we we cut out ovarian function and lower estrogen, the risk for fatty liver goes dramatically higher. And so whether you do exercise in a woman that's got normal ovarian function versus a woman that's um, post-menopause, there's going to be big genetic differences in how those livers respond to exercise because estrogen signaling is there or not there. Um, okay. Yeah. And then in terms of epigenetics, again, we're just starting to try to dig into this more. But the again, the HCR, LCR rats have big differences in epigenetic profiles in their liver, um, both at baseline and after you impose a high fat, high sucrose diet. And we think that those epigenetic differences in the HCR livers, the high capacity running livers, is what causes them to be more transcriptionally adaptable, to be able to have big changes in RNA expression when a new metabolic challenge comes on board. So Sorry, I should have explained. Sorry, can we just step back and explain epigenetics again and maybe just explain those? Uh, I should oh, have. oh, sorry. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. So, you know, people know genes, is, is DNA, and what you pass on to your offspring, yeah. or whatever, but they don't yeah. necessarily think about the fact that you've got, even if you don't change your genes, you can change the likelihood of them, those genes being turned off or turned on even from one generation to the next. So if you just explain that again, what you were saying, because I think I kind of lost people there with the... Yeah, uh, so your DNA, uh, which is where, you know, your gen genetic information is stored, um, has these regulatory sites called chromatin sites. And the chromatin can be more or less opened depending on the epigenetic regulation of uh, uh, the epigenetic marks on those on those um, on those sites. So if they're, the chromatin is more open, potentially there's greater uh, chance for uh, new RNA to be made and new and, and for uh, transcriptional ad adaptations to occur. And so in the high capacity running rats, we see evidence of much greater histone acetylation of these chromatin sites which means they should be more open and more adaptable to for RNA to change at a, in a fast in a fast way or a, a higher magnitude. Oh, well, that's, okay. I'm and that's because they that. yeah. they are just sort of born good runners without doing any training. They've got that. that, they that, seem, that yeah. yeah, they seem to be very adaptable to any stimulus. And the way the, the, the guy, uh, Dr. Britton, explains it in some of his review papers is that they're in a high state of entropy so that they're like, they're, and so if you have a high rate of entropy, you throw in any kind of challenge, they can adapt very quickly, where the low capacity runner have a low metabolic rate, they have a low rate of entropy, and they cannot adapt as readily. And so we're trying to see if these epigenetic marks are a part of that adaptability or not, right. which is really getting outside of my area of expertise. So I collaborate yeah, with uh, Dr. Kardik Shankar on this and some other people, and we're really just we're doing studies right now where we're trying to we're trying to see if the changes in metabolism that are induced by exercise are linked to these epigenetic marks or vice versa okay uh, yeah you also touched before on before versus after menopause so it reminded me that you've done some sex difference sort of studies as well do you want to mm -hmm. just tell us about that in terms of with exercise and diet sex differences yeah so um you know, a fundamental tenet that we we focus on in the liver is mitochondria in the liver and how exercise changes mitochondrial function and fat oxidation through the mitochondria in the liver. And what's interesting is that um, when we started, at first we didn't do any fatty liver studies in female rodents because we were like, what's the point? They don't develop fatty liver. And then we started thinking, well, we should study this because it's an experimental opportunity to understand why Same they're protected. Hmm. Yeah. And so what we found was that female livers have higher functioning mitochondria um, without exercise. They just have really high um, respiratory rates 
um, and they have low um, rates of reactive oxygen species production. Um, and that it takes exercise in the male livers to make them behave like the females. Oh, wow. So the females, we give them four weeks of wheel running. They just kind of stay the same because they're already high. But the, the four weeks of wheel running makes the males have oh, the wow. highest function of the females. However, if we do ovarectomies, which is basically cut out the ovaries and kind of like give a slam dunk okay. menopause one day, mm -hmm. it's not a good mild menopause, but it is taking away the ovaries and estrogen. Then the mitochondria in the females just collapse and they're terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have low respiratory rates. They have high H2O2 or a reactive oxygen species emission. Um, so estrogen plays a really powerful role in this. And we're trying to figure out how it does that. Does it do it through this uh, receptor called ER alpha, or is it working through other effects okay. at the whole body level? So is that is that seen in humans as well? Do, do, do females have uh, less fatty livers? Yep, it's well known that females have less fatty liver until they lose ovarian function. Oh, um, and so it's, you know, it's well known that obesity risk, visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, diabetes, all that really goes up dramatically um, after you lose ovarian function. Um, and now it's becoming more increasingly known that, that part of this risk is also greater risk for fatty liver. Um, Okay. And, you know, what we also see in the mice is that, and this is not just our lab, it's it's well known in the literature is that when you lose estrogen signaling, the animals become very inactive. And women who go through menopause, they, they tend to be, there's less, they're just less physically active. And so they have to really programmatically mm -hmm. increase exercise in their, in their daily living to try to counteract that. Okay. So just we've talked about rodent studies and in, in comparing to human studies a few times. How generally do they compare with the liver? I know you've said a few bits and pieces. I know you had a, a paper saying, you know, barriers to translating from rodent studies to humans. Do you want to just flesh that out a bit? Because it is something we have to consider, obviously. Yeah, I think in the areas that I've studied, which is mostly muscle metabolism and liver metabolism, I think that rodents are a very good model of human health. Um, there's a couple caveats. One is that mice probably aren't the best model compared to rats because mice have a really high um, energy expenditure and they rely on their liver to produce way more glucose relative to rats or humans. Um, and so when we're sitting here studying hepatic glucose metabolism in mice, I sometimes question the relevance because like I said, they just have much higher glucose production rates in their liver, and they're really dependent on their liver for metabolism um, compared to, to rats and humans. Um, the other caveat that is important is that when we do studies in rodents, we typically feed them a diet that's somewhere around 80 to 90 percent carbohydrates, very low fat, and then when we try to induce pathologies in them, we, we feed them a high fat, high sucrose diet. And the high fat can be anywhere from 40 to 60% of fat. And humans don't eat those kind of mm. diets. You, you know, humans are in the 30 to 40% fat range. Um, and their carbohydrates and proteins are, are, you know, carbohydrates are in the 30 to 40% range and proteins in the 15 to 20% range. So the diet differences between rodents and humans are a problem. And specifically, this probably um, is most important for fatty liver because there is a lot of data that excess carbohydrate intake through liquid beverages like soda in America or, you know, juices is a lot of the problem with fatty liver. And we don't really specifically focus on that in our rodent studies. Instead, we feed a high fat diet that maybe has some added sucrose, but it's not mimicking the human diet. So People need to be uh, considerate of that when they're when they're doing their studies. And in fact, a high fat diet can lower de novo lipogenesis. The liver actually senses that there's lots of lipids coming mm. in, and so it shuts down making lipids, even if the mm. carbohydrates are high. So there's some problems there in terms of translating rodent work to human work. That makes sense. And in terms of diets, um, a lot of people, especially on Twitter, there's all this talk about carnivore diets and keto diets. And I'm not gonna. I know you haven't done work on that but i'm figuring you're probably not a keto fan based on what we've talked about um i i don't so we actually have a pro i have a project with uh, dr peter crawford studying um ketogenic flux but we are going at it a different way 
Um, I, I think it's going to be, I think there is a lot of evidence that ketones have lots of positive uh, signaling effects. Um, but I don't think the way to have them induced is chronic ketogenic diet. I just don't think that people are going to be able to do that or want to do that chronically. But you can induce ketogenic oscillations by fasting for half of the day or by exercising in a fasted condition versus exercising in a fed condition. There's old studies in the literature showing that you get dramatically different ketogenic production if you exercise in the morning after an overnight fast versus exercising in the afternoon after you've had a couple of meals. So I am interested in the ketogenic uh, literature, and obviously that is a hepatic or liver specific metabolism program that signals to other events in the body. So I think that's important to study, and I'm I'm in on that. But yeah, in terms of going long term on a low carb diet, I I, I don't. I just don't think people can stick with it or will want to stick with it. Of okay. course, if this is going to be posted on Twitter. I'll get lots of haters, but maybe, well, I'm not going to it up, but uh, I just assuming I was, maybe I'm thinking too simplistically that a high, I guess what I'm saying, you know, like we've talked about a high fat diet is not particularly good for the liver. But are you? Yeah. yeah if you, I mean, you know, it's hard to know. I don't know what data is out there. I mean, if you lower carbohydrate, I do know this, that if in, I think there was a study from UT Southwestern, uh, maybe in like two to four weeks, that if you go to a low carb diet, the liver fat will go down dramatically in human subjects. Uh, I just don't know how long, but that's a probably a high, that's probably a eucaloric diet where they're getting the appropriate energy intake for their energy needs. I don't know if someone's on a hypercaloric diet and they're eating a ton of lipids uh, and maybe that data is out there. I don't know. Yes, that um, makes but, me but, think. Yeah. So, okay. Cause that's you, Cloric. So you're saying it's, it's probably not above for their energy expenditure. I guess it made me just think, do you know, if, I guess people have done studies on this where they've done, um, you know, normal fat, high carbohydrate, um, you know, normal carb, high fat, you know, normal, normal, you know, the four combinations or whatever. Do we know yeah. it's probably too simplistic again, but do we know which one's worse? Is it the, the high I'm carb or the high fat? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there would be a difference in a eucaloric condition, but I will, I will say, and I haven't really pointed this out enough, that part of the pathology of fatty liver is hyperinsulinemia. So if you get rid of the hyperinsulinemia by, by cutting the carbs dramatically, it does seem to have positive effects on liver fat again by lowering de novo lipogenesis and by lowering this hormone that's you know an anabolic hormone that drives mm. storage so i, I think don't you're gonna give a lot of people that. loving you on twitter actually <laughs> yeah well but you know whenever they're on twitter talking about carbs kill a lot of them are talking about the carb carbohydrate insulin model and the mm -hmm. carbohydrates drive pathological insulin levels and mm -hmm. you and i know that I can eat a lot of carbohydrates as long as I'm active and I don't get pathological insulin levels. That exactly. the hyperinsulinemia you get with those conditions is just as much driven by the inactivity and sedentary behavior as it is the diet. So that's where yeah. I get kind of hung up on that, on those arguments. Yes, perfect. All right, now just to the, the other twist with diet is I know you've done calor caloric restriction. So how, how did you go with that? Oh, well, what we, would, what we would do when we were early on studying exercise is that in our rodents, invariably, unfortunately, they will lose weight or they'll lose adiposity when we impose exercise on them. And we didn't want reviewers to say, okay, well, all of your effects on liver steatosis are due to the weight loss. So we would usually have a control group that we would calorically restrict to lose the same amount of weight as the exercisers. And then compare those two conditions to say, okay, aha, this is actually induced okay. by exercise, and this one's induced by the, the lower adiposity. Okay. I, I was thinking you, I should have actually read the paper. I was thinking you were okay. doing another chronic, uh, you know, calorie restriction stuff, but that's that's different. No, it's okay. But, but yeah, that's why we, we kind of use that. And we did learn stuff from those studies. No, it's, it's, it's as a control. Um, all right. So the other thing I thought I, I might do is talk about some other bits and pieces you're doing that you're uh, excited about. So you did... You did mention the bile studies. Uh, what were you doing there and why? What was the idea? So 
So when, as I was discussing earlier, we like to use the, the HCR rats are protected from steatosis and the LCRs are susceptible. High so capacity runners trained. and low capacity. And this is yeah. without training them. Yep. Yep. Without training. Right. And so yeah. when we were phenotyping those animals and trying to figure out why they're protected or why they're susceptible, we got to where we we're like, man, all these things that they're protected by don't seem to be that much related to the liver. How does the liver, you know, maybe it's all related to systemic metabolism differences. So we thought, well, let's look at, let's do a gene array or, or where we, we basically take the livers from each strain after they've been on the diet, a high fat, high sucrose diet for only three days. And let's look at how they adapt um, at an RNA level, gene expression level after this, they've been on this diet for only three days. And what we found was that the high capacity rats had way more genes change, but of the genes that changed, um, the number one gene that was upregulated was a gene called CYP7A1, which is the uh, rate limiting gene for bile acid synthesis. And what it does is it takes cholesterol and converts it to bile acids. And then we did follow-up studies where we then wanted to know, well, what, why would they have higher bile acids and higher CYP7A1 expression? And so just to kind of give you a background on that, when you, uh, you, you make bile acids in the liver, you store them in the gallbladder. When you eat a meal, the gallbladder dumps them into the intestines where they help break lipids down um, and they help absorb nutrients. And that's all they thought were thought to do for a long time. But now they're known to be potent bioactive signaling um, um, mechanisms or uh, chemicals. And 95% of them get recycled back to the liver and you lose about 5% in the stool. So some smart people I talked to said, well, you should see if they have differences in their fecal bile acid loss. Um, between the strains. So we did that and we found that the HCR rats, the high capacity running rats that are metabolically protected, had way more bile acids in their stool. Um, and that's probably why they had greater bile acid uh, synthesis is because when you lose more in the stool, the liver senses that and, and starts to make more to compensate and maintain homeostasis. And long story short, we're really interested in if that is an important metabolic effect in the liver that occurs with exercise, and if it's important for risk for steatosis, if it's important for maintenance of cholesterol levels at the whole body level, and various other questions. So we're doing follow-up studies on that now. Okay, wow, okay. Now, one other one that caught my eyes, um, you had early life stress reduces voluntary exercise and its, prevent and its prevention of diet-induced obesity and metabolic dysfunction in mice. So I I'd actually had an interest in that because we've done some sort of early exercise, early life, um, you know, father on a high fat diet, how does that affect the offspring and, and um, you know, et cetera, and born small, which is a, a stress for the, yep. the animal. So what were you doing there and what did you find? Yeah, so when I, I came here to uh, KU Med about, uh, I guess, almost eight years ago, and one of the collaborators on my floor is Dr. Julie Christensen. And actually, there's a lot of people on my floor who do exercise work, but they do it in a non-traditional way. They're studying pain, they're studying, uh, you know, neuropathies, they're studying brain health. Um, and anyway, Julie was doing studies where she gives this early life stress model where you basically take the pup away from their mom for like an hour every day, just during that 21 day period. Um, and, and looking at how that programs uh, greater pain sensitivity later in their life. And what she started seeing was that those animals were heavier. Um, so they seemed to be heavier, but she also was doing exercise studies that if she gave them wheels to exercise, it got rid of the effects of the early life stress on the obesity and on the pain. Um, and so we recruited a postdoc, uh, Dr. Becca Forright, about three years ago to work on these studies with us. And that's one of the first papers that's come out. We're trying to establish how does early life stress lead to greater obesity? How does early life stress lead to the animals not wanting to run as much on the running wheels? Um, that's amazing because I, I didn't I hadn't heard of that. But we, we did if, if, if your father's on a high-fat diet and then you exercise the offspring early in life, you can overcome the metabolic mm -hmm. problems and the same if you're if it's born small they get increased diabetes later in life and we can affect that by exercising early in life so it's the same same thing i wasn't aware of that that's awesome yep. all right now just before i let you go here one thing i ask people here and there is um 
have you had um you know any papers that have done like better than you thought you thought oh this is you know this is okay and then it ends up being cited millions of times or con con you know the inverse of that have you yeah. had papers where you think this is really hot and then no one even you know talks about it well i thought i'd talk about two papers uh one paper was this kind of study i did uh i didn't lead it but it was during my phd where there was a class in our department that was a plyometric class and my PhD mentor, Dr. Potiger, thought we should do a study examining power output um, in this class. And that involves studying body composition and all these measures. And so all these poor students were uh, participants in the study. And one of them was my wife that I've been married to now for 17 years, wow. uh, eight, almost 18 years. And she, I was measuring body fat on her with skinfold calipers the first time we met. So that was awkward. And I guess you didn't pinch it too hard then. Because sometimes I didn't you can pinch do it that. too hard. We did not like uh, each other at that first interaction, but we okay. got to know each other later. Uh, that's and great. that's been actually cited a ton um, because I guess there's probably not very much good plyometric literature out there. Maybe it's your wife uh, running around telling people to cite it, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and then another study that happened early on in my career, which was kind of really accidental, is we... I needed to get a pilot grant so I could get muscle biopsies and glucose tolerance tests going in human subjects. And so we came up with this idea of comparing statins versus statins plus exercise on metabolic syndrome outcome factors. And really, the statins are going to win. They're going to lower triglycerides and LDL. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. But what we ended up finding was that statins blocked exercise adaptations in these in these human subjects. And that got a lot of press and got a lot of um interest from the field. And so we're actually now, uh, we have a second big clinical trial that's finishing up this summer where we're trying to dig deeper into how statins affect muscle metabolism and exercise adaptations. And so that was a study that was kind of just complete luck or complete mistake that we found these, what seemed to be important findings, because a lot of patients are told to take statins and exercise. And if they don't interact well together, we need to know that. Then again, I don't know if it's you or some others, they're finding that statins can be beneficial sometimes with exercise and metformin and things as well, right? So does it? Well, it seems like statins are um, have, um, what do you want to call them, um, off-target effects that can be a positive, especially in people that are really diseased. Um, okay. that they can have some anti-inflammatory effects. They can be good for heart disease through other mechanisms other than just lowering cholesterol in people that are really diseased. But for other people, um, you know, they cause some myalgia oh, yeah. and, mm. and a lot of endurance athletes don't like to take them. They can't tolerate them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot we don't know yet. Yep. Yeah. You see, talking about finding what you don't expect to sometimes. We did a sim for stat statin study and expecting to have all this muscle damage and mitochondrial problems and whatever. And it was pretty mild in the study. Yeah. We did. What I like to do quite often at the end is, is just have some sort of bottom line takeaway messages what's a few things you'd like people to sort of take away from this chat yeah i mean I, i'd like people to realize that exercise or physical activity affects almost every tissue and every cell in the body um and you know it's not going to fix every disease but it really has profound effect on how diseases manifest and how diseases are treated um and we need to get outside of the box that it's mostly a cardiovascular or a muscle effect um, the other thing I'd like to highlight is that we spend so much time linking exercise and physical activity to, to obesity status or talking about how it influences body weight. And I really wish we would dissect those things because you can be healthier at almost any body weight if you move more. Um, and so when we connect those things, people will start exercising. They don't see changes in the mirror. So they quit thinking it's not benefiting them. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so those are the two biggest things I'd like to Perfect. Be with. And actually just, just thinking about, so we know that with exercise increases insulin sensitivity in the muscle for 24 to 48 hours. And again, obviously you haven't changed your weight. Is it the same sort of time course for the liver? Do you know? I think so. Yeah. I think there's data that would suggest it's about that there's a, yeah, like there's a effect that occurs for a period of time. Yes. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot for coming on. It's been great. And uh, thank you, Glenn. Good to see you, and I appreciate yeah. you giving me this forum. Yeah, good on you. Okay, see you, mate. Bye bye. See you, buddy. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.